Hey, good afternoon everyone. It's Tractor Man 44 here. This is the wrong kind of tractor. It's a Pullman Pro, and I think they're made by Electrolux, believe it or not. I thought they were a carpet cleaner uh, company. It's a 700DX, which is a 26 horsepower uh, V-twin, horizontal twin, Briggs & Stratton engine. If you hit a hit a stob out in the woods, hit a tree trunk or a root or something like that, you know, and stall the engine, you know, if something else doesn't break and you stall the engine, or you're trying to start it and for whatever reason it backfires during start, you have a fairly heavily weighted flywheel, especially when you get up around 26 horsepower. But that sudden stop wants to stop that forward motion or forward rotation of that flywheel, and it'll come to an abrupt halt. On these engines, what they have most of the time for a flywheel key is an aluminum key. And what happens is it'll either shear completely off, putting it completely out of time, or it will just partially shear, which adjusts your ignition timing to where it doesn't want to start, or if it does try to start, it'll just continually backfire. You want your fuel mixture to ignite just a few degrees before top dead center. That way it'll get, by the time the piston gets to the top, the whole area of the cylinder will be engulfed in that explosion and have more power exerted on the downward stroke of that piston. If you wait until the piston gets all the way to the top, it's already missing some of its capability to push force on the piston. Various engines have a certain degrees before top dead center that they want that ignition process to happen in the cylinder. If the keyway partially shears and that process happens a few degrees more than the predetermined amount that it's supposed to be from the factory, you're actually exploding that, pushing downward on the piston while it's on the upstroke. And it wants to go backwards, it wants to backfire, it builds up pressure in a crankcase and blows oil out of the sump. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go ahead and pull this nut off the flywheel and I'm going to come up with a puller. I think I probably have a puller that's just about right for this guy right here. And we're going to go ahead and thread into those 516 holes with some grade 8 bolts. We're going to see if we can pull that flywheel. As soon as we pull the flywheel, we should be able to tell if that, uh, if that diagnosis is going to be correct or not because we'll be able to see that crankshaft key or that flywheel key at that point. A lot of times that will take care of it for you. I can see the key right here. It doesn't appear to be uh, sheared. Okay, I have to admit, it did not appear to be sheared, but I got a new key. I'm putting in a new Briggs & Stratton key just for the heck of it, but I went ahead and took the time and blew all the dirt, filth, dust, and everything out from around the, uh, the whole top of the engine. So let's see if we can slip this back on here. Got the flywheel pretty much tightened down on there. I think it calls for 150 foot-pounds of torque, something like that. But now we're going to go ahead and check the, uh, the gap right here between the coil and the flywheel. On the magnetron, and that's what they call these newer ones, the old ones are just point, uh, point and condenser ignition. But this is a magnetron and it requires 8 to 12 thousandths of an inch. It's doggone close to it. We'll spin the magnet around to the other side. We'll do this guy here. Well, we went through the process to, uh, to determine that the keyway definitely was not the problem. I'm going to pull the valve covers and take a look at the exhaust valves or the, the, the valve settings. Should be nice to see that it's jumped off the rocker or something like that. Well, look at there. There's my rocker arm down here. Check this out. I got a bent push rod. Here's the other valve cover. Here you go, look at this. Both exhaust valve push rods. There's number one, there's number two. 
but these engines have a tendency to overheat if you don't keep them exceptionally clean and the valve guides actually separate they begin moving inside the head uh, because I think everything just heats up and it kind of swells a little bit the aluminum swells a little more rapidly than the uh, than the steel valve guides and then what happens is the valve guides ever so gentle start moving along with the valves and that throws everything out of kelter and that's what pops these uh, things to the side and results in bending those push rods and I look right down here inside the spring on the exhaust valve and I can see the valve guide is literally pushed out of the head and it's all the way up almost near the end of the stem and it's only allowing the valve to be depressed just a short distance and it's coming in contact with that valve guide so it's time to pull the head off but before I pull the head off I'm going to check that other one over there and I'm going to have to go ahead and pull the intake and everything off uh, this whole assembly all the throttling assembly and everything I've already taken the intake rocker arm off I've got the whole uh, center area where all the carburetor and shrouds and everything mount that's all removed throttle linkages everything removed looks like the coil is actually mounted to the head so we'll pull that coil by the way these things have a diode in them if you install them upside down they're not going to work because a diode is like a check valve for electricity it only allow electron flow in one direction If I had a better camera, you could actually see the guide pushed up right there. When it comes around pulling the valves, if you're like me, you've got a variety of, of choices to choose from, but only one of them is going to work right. First thing you got to do is go decide, you know, which one you're going to use. Well, obviously you can't use this one here. This is used for much, much larger engines, and this thing's probably 80 years old or whatever. Uh, it's got its place, but it places on much larger engines and not this one here. This one here, we actually made an adapter for this one here on that uh, 400 cc Suzuki we're working on right now. Uh, I had to make a, an iron pipe adaption inside here to, uh, to do what we needed. So this worked fine on that particular head. Now that head is a very similar to this head here, just physically a little bit larger, but it worked very, very well. But this is still too big for this machine here. So then you go to your, your old standard tried and true small engine. You stick this in here on your springs like this and you twist this and, and whatever and whatever you do it'll compress it it'll compress the spring you pull your keepers out you release it and then take the whole thing apart this one won't work because the thickness of the, the the tool is too wide to fit in the coils of the spring so that's not going to work this one here is another small engine tool i've had for years and years um haven't used it probably five or six times in all the time i've had it but you see how it's offset right here that's because as the the spring spiral, you know, it changes elevation, so you have this little bit of an offset so that you can latch on to the spring equally. And as you compress this or turn this down, this is going to push down this inner portion, will push down on the uh, top of the valve spring and that flat little bonnet that sits up there. And these are going to pull up on the spring. And as you continue to tighten this down, it'll release your keepers, pull them out with a magnet, release this, you're good to go. That one might work on this particular one. This one here might work on, on this one too. This is a variation of just a hand tool. It's got a, bo a bolt hole in the middle for a fulcrum and you bolt that down on where your rocker arm would be. Stick this underneath and pry down, raise up whatever you have to do in order to compress that spring to get the keepers out. But many, many times, you know, <laughs> you're left to your own uh, resources, so to speak. Uh, this is an old wrench I've used for a number of things. I've actually adapted. You see how I ground it down thin, you know, to get into a certain spot. Um, and if you notice something, there's a, there's a hole right here in the middle. There's a reason for that hole. There's your rocker arm mounting bolt right here. I'm going to show you what we're going to do with that. And I might use that one on this particular one here. We'll go ahead and set that right on top of that uh, bonnet. And we'll thread this in. The reason it would be nice to have this clamped down is because it's going to want to raise up as soon as I put pressure on the back side here so it's going to be a little might have to be a little creative but see when I push up on that you see that right there so let me get my magnet ready if I raise up back here push down on the valve springs reach in here there's one clip now your valve keepers are always going to be metallic they're always going to be a ferrous material so they're always going to want to jump out with your magnet so I like to leave them stuck to the magnet so I don't lose them and then you can go ahead and gently release your tool 
these little heads, there's not much tension on those springs. They're fairly easily, easily compressed. But I guess the point of the story is you don't have to have a big fancy piece of equipment. All you have to have is an old wrench that you use for other things and go ahead and use it like that. So here you go right here. Here's a little bonnet. Here's my valve spring. The valve will go out the bottom side. I got a pin punch large enough to put on, push on the outer surface of the valve guide. I got enough pressure to hold my punch in place. I'm just going to gently push down. We're going to push that guide right out the other end. There it went. Here we are right here. Going back to this, the reason you want to use a pin punch is because a pin punch has no taper. These are made to drive out pins of a specific size. So I picked one approximately the diameter of the of the valve guide in order to push it out. If you use a tapered punch, of course, you're going to do some damage or inside that head. I got a piece of copper, half inch copper. I cut a slice in it down pretty deep so that I can actually swell it open. I'm going to take this guide that we just pressed out of the head over there. I'm going to push this guide all the way down inside here. And I'm going to leave me just a little bit of an area stick out over here. I'm going to leave that little bit of an area stick out. That's going to be the part that's going to be pressed in from the exhaust port all the way up towards the base of the valve stem. But I'm making this like this because what I'm going to do, put that copper on there and I'm going to run just a little blob of weld. It's not going to be pretty, just going to be a tiny little spot here and there, a couple of places, so that whenever it goes back in and then the engine gets hot, the area that this is pressed into swells a little bit, it can't go out. It might loosen a little bit in the opening, but it cannot possibly uh, go back up into the valve like it did before to cause the issue. So I put that copper on there because you can weld to the steel, the copper is not going to allow it to stick, so I should just be able to put a, a tiny blob, blob, blob and be done with it. Copper is conductive, but yeah, well, it did melt it a little bit, but you can't really weld copper to steel. Uh, so it's going to pop loose, and that's exactly what it did. It popped right out of there, and I've got a nice sharp edge right here to rest on whenever I press it back into the head. And that's going to be exposed in the actual exhaust port. So the welds stay up on this end right here because the exhaust port is over here. So I got this on another pin punch. I'm just going to slide it right down inside here and just put just enough pressure on it to make sure the valve guide holds into place. So now that that's in place, we'll go ahead and set this up vertically and gently press this down in there. Clean a little carbon off. The seat looks really good. I can see exactly where it's sealing, but there's no wear on it whatsoever. I've cleaned this seat up also as well. So when it comes around to putting the valve seals on the valve guides, this is exceptionally thin. So if you just put pressure on it from here on the top, you're going to collapse the rubber, you're going to collapse the spring, you're going to do some damage to it. I went over to the lathe and I got a piece of scrap blower shaft, took digital calipers, and then measured the outside diameter of the rubber and the spring, and then added a few thousandths to it, checked my drill bit index, and came up with a drill bit that's just that specific size. Well, and I, I drilled this in the lathe, so it's fairly accurate. So this will fit down in there perfectly, so I should be able to set that right on the top. But first things first, we're going to put a little bit of lubrication on there. So I think any kind of lubricant is okay. I put a little bit of 3-in-1 uh, oil on it simply because I had it available, and I ringed the, uh, the valve guide with that oil also. So hopefully down here I'll be able to maintain it nice and square. Sit that right on top like this. It went on, it went on perfectly. Good to go. I'll put that in the tool drawer now. Of course I got another head to do. I'm just going to stuff a little bit of a rag underneath here to hold the valve in place and put a little bit of lubricant on the valve stem. Now you know most guys have good enough grip where you can actually push that down and hold it, but uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to to get your keepers in, so I don't like to hurt my fingers, but I can just push it down with the wrench. You guys will find out as you get older, you get arthritis in those joints, and it really hurts you to push on them that long. So there you go. Time to put this head on. We're going to torque it down in the right torque sequence, in the right torque setting. This calls for 220 inch-pounds of torque. So what I like to do, if I'm unfamiliar with the particular engine, I like to go ahead and draw up exactly what I'm looking at as far as the, the tightening sequence. I've got it drawn here as the top. 
here's the push rod here, here's the spring here, here's your push rod, here's your spring, and here's your top. Sequence should be one, two, three, four, five. So I just bring it up just a little bit snug. I mean, nothing at all. This calls for 220 inch pounds, but I'm gonna go to 100 inch pounds on the very first torque setting. Then I'll go to 100 and 150 or thereabouts. There's 150 for the second torque. Now I'll go into the 220. Okay, it's time for the rocker arms and the push rods. Top dead center is a funny thing, you know, without a, a scope or something. If you have something like this right here, we usually use a welding rod or just anything, a pencil, anything. You can just stick it down in there and one guy can turn the crank and you just watch the pencil or the welding rod come up. But uh, I've had this guy here for a long time and this is pretty cool, but you gotta be careful with them. If the spark plug's at an angle to the cylinder, Whenever the piston comes up, it's going to want to push this sideways and it'll bind up. It could possibly bend this or it could do damage to the, the top of your piston. Now watch it extending out here. i got to make sure it doesn't get in a bind. I'm very close to top dead center because I can see here the magnetron mark is going past. So I get her right up here. So I'm going to go with right there. That'll be a good rudimentary uh, starting point. And again, it's not in a bind against the piston or anything. And so we're going to go ahead and adjust this cylinder here to... Uh, I think this one calls for, I think it's 5 thousandths cold. On these guys here, the push rods are identical in length. Uh, the smaller steel one is going to be the exhaust and the uh, fatter aluminum is going to be the intake. This is the exhaust right here going right in, in line with the muffler tailpipe. Now we got to go about the business of getting the 5 thousandths adjustment here. There we go, that's good. Good, good to go. Okay, got both heads back on. I got the uh, magnetron set for uh, 10 thousandths of an inch on the flywheel. I got the valves intake and exhaust cold set at 5 thousandths of an inch. Got the solenoid for the gas wired in. I think everything is ready to go. Battery is still very, very bad. Uh, battery's not gonna work at all, actually. But I've got it on a charger and I'm gonna set it on 200 amp jump start setting. So let's keep our fingers crossed and see what's going to happen. I did put about three gallons of fresh gas in with that old gas that's in the tank. Turn that to 200 amp. Choke it, give it half throttle. Well, all that's left to do is a little fine tuning, put the uh, plastic back on, put the more deck on, and put this puppy to work. And you know what? This is Tractor Man 44. I am out of here, guys.